I think I'd be ignorant to say that Christianity is the only right religion. I don't know what the right religion is. It's just what I believe it is. Some people that I've met, it's just I, I've had friends, and and the minute they find out about me, or the minute that I I do anything that doesn't follow their religion, I'm they they don't want anything to do with me. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad that can come out of it. And I'm not sure if it's from religion that the bad or the good comes out of it, or whether it's the people. I respect a lot of faiths and. I think that Christianity is a pillar that's influenced by the other great religions in the world. La cristianidad es muy importante porque podemos aprender valores cristianos donde no podemos, uh, donde descubrimos más acerca de nosotros. My view on anyone who claims to have a monopoly on truth is that there's no one truth about anything. I think that a lot of religions say the same thing in different ways. Those of you that are still looking for a space to sit, there's a few spots down front. And again, some of you, if you don't mind moving toward the middle, we'd appreciate that. I know when people ask me to move to the middle, I just pretend like they're not talking and I ignore them, which you may choose to do, and I understand, but we're just trying to make room for our guests. You heard in the video there introducing the topic, and if you're new with us and you haven't been tracking along, we're in a series uh, called Explore God, not just us, but hundreds of churches around the Chicagoland area looking at these sort of big big questions that we don't always stop and think about when you're just got your head down going through life. Questions like, does life have a purpose? And is there a God? And if there is a God and he's all powerful and all good, why, do, why does suffering happen in the world? And, and you probably could hear in the video the question for this morning. Is Christianity too narrow? Is Jesus really the only way? I mean, isn't it rather arrogant and narrow-minded thing to claim that you have a monopoly on truth? How do we reconcile that? Uh, in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, uh, says when he, the phrase mere Christianity, he doesn't mean mere as in simplistic, he means like essential. And he says he's trying to invite people into what he calls like a long hallway in a great country manor house in England, out of which open many doors. Because the hallway you're not meant to live in, the doors are places where there's food and chairs and fireplaces and you, and you want to come in. But the hallway is at least the place where you begin to take seriously the questions of belief. In a sense, that's what this series is. We're inviting you into the hallway to ask the big questions, to wrestle through these things and think about them from a Christian perspective. Because God wants to invite us all the way in to a life where we live with him. And these questions are the kind of questions that I think in a sense get you into the hallway. This question particularly is a big one. Is Christianity too narrow? There are lots of ways to ask this. How can Jesus be the only way to God? Aren't all religions essentially the same? People in our contemporary Western secular pluralistic culture, we'll talk about those words in a minute, are nervous. You heard it a moment ago, and the woman at the end, she, the woman at the end, she said, I, I think it's a very arrogant thing, anybody who claims to know the truth. That's a pervasive view in our culture today. People are very nervous about anyone who claims to have an absolute truth. Karl Popper, in his famous book, The Open Society, writes, belief that one possesses the truth is always implicitly totalitarian. And it's but a short step from the confidence that says, I have the truth, to the tyranny that says, therefore, you must obey me. It's sometimes put this way. Your truth is good for you. It may not be good for me or work for me. Let's not, try, don't impose that on anybody. And, and those who try to do that, claim that there's one objective truth for all people at all times, that's part of the problem in the world. That's how wars start. That's how people are oppressed. And, but we're going to look at something that, you know, Jesus says in John chapter 14 and put it in context. And it's, it's very popular to think of Jesus as this humble, kind-hearted, traveling guy who said wise, spiritual things, who was very down on religious authority and very pro those who were oppressed and, and, and hurting. And there's some truth in that notion. But nobody likes to focus on some of these shocking, controversial, hard-edged things Jesus said. And we're going to look at one of those things uh, this morning. So if you have your Bible, open to John 14. If not, we'll follow on the screen. We're going to read verses 5 through 11. Some of you will recognize at least one very famous verse in here. Beginning with verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus has just said he's going to go away after he's crucified. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. 
And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Now, we're going to unpack some more of this statement next week when we talk about, is Jesus really God? Did he claim that, and can we trust that? But this is a pretty shocking thing, Jesus says. Two of the questions it raises is, is he God, and can you trust the reliability of the Bible? Some people have said, well, he didn't, Jesus didn't really claim to be God. Well, he clearly does here. Others have said, well, the, the New Testament's been doctored over centuries to, like, revisionist history to make it sound like he claimed that. Those two questions, is Jesus really God and can you trust the Bible, are next week and the week after. So stay with us. We're going to tackle those questions. But today I want to deal with this idea of the narrowness of the Christian gospel. Is it arrogant? And is it narrow-minded? By looking at three great myths in our culture and then one great truth claim. Okay, so three common myths and one truth claim of Jesus. First myth, all religions are basically the same. Sure, there are some minor differences, superficial differences, but at their core, they're teaching the same things. And when people say this, they're usually referring to the moral codes. We should love each other. We should be kind. We should be generous. We should serve. We shouldn't be selfish. We shouldn't oppress. All religions say something about that. And so really, they're all saying the same thing, even if they have superficial differences. I hear this all the time. Perhaps you've thought this or think it still. But actually, when you look closely... And I'm not a religious scholar in all religions, but I've done a little bit of studying. Perhaps you have as well. When you look closer, the exact opposite is true. If religions are similar, it's at a superficial level. There are superficial similarities, but if you get, dig into the core teachings about ultimate reality, about human destiny, about the meaning of life, about the reality of God, they say profoundly, irreconcilably different things. They're not the same at the level that matters. If you examine and compare them, you find massive differences. Let's just take the concept of God for a minute. You'll see a little chart here that highlights this. In four of the big ones, the world religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Christianity asserts there's one eternally existent God who is the creator of all, and that he sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to save it through his sacrificial death. He teaches a lot more than that, but that's the essence of God. God is eternally existent, one being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, existing before time. And he sent Jesus, himself, the second person of the Trinity, into the world to save it. We'll talk about that more next week. Islam believes in strict obedience to the God Allah and denies that Jesus is the unique son of God and denies that he died on a cross. Those are not reconcilable differences. They're very significant differences. Those are not superficial differences. Hinduism teaches that there are millions of gods, and in fact, you are also on your way to becoming God through the process of reincarnation following the law of karma. Buddhism doesn't really believe in the existence of a personal God at all, not in any sense that a Christian or, or, or Judaism or Islam does, and teaches that we must seek to reach a state of nirvana by following the path of the Buddha. Now, these are simplistic statements. They're generalizations, but they're fairly accurate. They're not reconcilable. When it comes to the nature of ultimate reality, where human life is headed, what it means, and the reality of God, these four major world religions do not teach the same thing on any level. So my point in saying this is it's not just Christianity making truth claims. We all do it. All world religions do it. All people do it. We have to think about, well, which one lines up with my experience of life, with the reality I see around me? with the reality of, my, of human nature, which one is worth giving my life to. I mean, think about it for just a minute. Does it really make sense that if there's a God, if God exists, that he would go to one group of people in one part of the world at one period in history and say, you wanna to relate to me? Here's what you do. You follow the five pillars of this book called the Quran. you obey me strictly, and you'll reach paradise but I, I don't have a son named Jesus. I didn't send him into the world, and that's not who I am. And then go to another group of people over here and say, yeah, what I told those guys, forget all that. For you people, what I am is uh, I'm in all things. I'm in, I'm in nature, I'm in you, and you're in me, and really, you're on your way to becoming like me, and if you're in the process of being reincarnated until you reach nirvana. 
And they go to another group of people and say, yeah, yeah, forget all that. Well, those are for those guys. For you people, I am Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I have give my unique son Jesus to forgive your sin. You must trust in him and obey me. And then go, does that make sense? If there's one God, that he would do this over and over again in various ways? No. What makes sense is if there's one true God, he would make one way, reveal himself in one way, and make that clear by the giving of his son and of his word. So myth number two. All religions are equally true. So you might say, well, okay, okay, fair enough. Maybe the religions are, are not all the same, but that they're equally valid or they're equally true. I'll, I'll take your point, Pastor Jeff, that they don't all teach exactly the same thing, but when you, none of us can really know all that there is to know, and so they're really equally true on their own level. You heard the, in the video a couple people mention, nobody can know all, the, know all truth or know what's really true. Truth is relative, truth is personal. Truth is personally, individually determined. This, <laughs> the idea that Christianity is just one philosophy among many. Now we do live in a, a nation that by the First Amendment protects religious freedom, religious liberty. You are free to worship your way. That's a good thing in our society. As a Christian minister, I'm glad that we live in a country that's free, where people aren't forced to follow Jesus or follow Muhammad or anybody else for that matter where there is freedom, that's a, that's a good and healthy thing. In fact, the idea is that there's an open marketplace of ideas and worldviews where we can debate them on their merits. We don't do this very well in our culture these days. We divide and yell at each other on Facebook, but it's supposed to be a place where we have an open marketplace to discuss these things. But just because all religions are protected under the First Amendment does not mean they're all equally true. Equal protection doesn't mean equal truth. We make that mistake all the time in our culture. D.A. Carson wrote a book called The Intolerance of Tolerance. It's a great book. It says, tolerance used to mean, as a virtue, I firmly disagree with your position on this issue. But out of respect for your dignity as a human being, I tolerate your right to hold a varying opinion from me. And I won't hate you, or demonize you, or belittle you or condemn, condemn you. Today, tolerance means I cannot disagree with you or I'm intolerant. That's not tolerance. And if, you're, if you disagree, you're considered intolerant. That's, what, that's the title of his book, The Intolerance of Tolerance. I'm gonna talk myself into confusion if I keep using that word. <laughs> the idea is that a society with a plurality of ideas is a good thing. But if we take pluralism to mean that you can't have truth claims or you're intolerant, that's a very bad thing. It leads to destructive behaviors and confusion. You see, even the claim, now you're gonna have to think about this, you're gonna have to strain your brain here. Even the claim that there is no such thing as absolute truth is itself a claim to absolute truth. Do you follow? There's no absolute truth. That's a pretty absolute thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody has an absolute truth claim. Wait a second. My, my son, Noah, is, uh, graduated from college a semester early and took the LSATs, the law school entrance exams, l last Saturday. I said, how'd it go? He texted me back, it is finished. <laughs> That's what Jesus said on the cross, do you feel crucified? You know, like, <laughs> there, it's six four timed 45 minute sections of intense reading and questioning, I couldn't do it. Now what if he gets his scores back and says, well listen, you may think that's true, but that wasn't my truth. I mean, I, don't, I, I have a different way of interpreting this question. My truth is different than your truth. It doesn't work that way. We know this in certain areas of life. Why would we think it'd be different when it comes to ultimate reality? Why would we understand this when it comes to particulars of science or engineering or law school entrance exams and then think when it comes to ultimate reality, well, it's just up to you. Truth by definition is exclusive. It excludes certain things by, saying, by affirming other things. It has hard edges and boundaries to it. We don't like that, but that's true. This, the classic argument for this idea that all religions are equally true or equally valid, you know, your truth is yours and my truth is mine, we shouldn't fight about it, and none of us can really know anyway, is, is often given in this uh, metaphor, this ancient parable really about the blind men and the elephant. Now I told this story in brief a couple weeks ago at our South Street campus, so if you heard it then, you're gonna get to hear it again. 
But so how many of you know this story? The blind man and the elephant, a few of you? Okay. It, goes, it actually dates way back uh, to, uh, to a couple hundred years uh, before the birth of Christ uh, from the continent of India, um, or the country of ancient area of India, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, the, the gurus would use this to say, none of us can know ultimate reality perfectly. At best, we can have an incomplete knowledge. So imagine a group of blind men who are groping their way around feeling an elephant. And one is feeling a tusk, and he says, an elephant is like a long spear that's curved. And the other one is at the ear, it says, no, no, no. An elephant is like a great leaf, a fan. And the other is at the, the foot, and the rear says, no, no, no. An elephant's like a tree trunk, rough and solid. And the other is at the sides, and no, no, an elephant is like a wall, a great firm wall. Well, they're all right to a degree, but they only have incomplete knowledge. And this is often used to do, sort of say, you see, all the real religions are like this. We're all groping our way. We may know a little bit of the truth, but none of us know the whole thing. And God is so much bigger than any one religion could ever communicate. Now, I know even saying that right now, that feels good. That sounds right to our postmodern, pluralistic, individualistic ears. But Leslie Newbegin, who was a Christian missiologist and was a missionary in India, put the image back up if you don't mind, writes about this. And he says... It's very subtle, but it's very profound what he says. The problem with this parable, while it sounds humble, it's actually very arrogant because the story is told from the point of view of the king who sees the full elephant, who's not blind, but can see what the blind men are unable to grasp, the full reality. The story is constantly told in order to neutralize the affirmation of the great religions, to suggest they earn humility and recognize that none of them can have more than one tiny aspect of the truth. But of course, the real point of the story is exactly the opposite. Because if the one who tells it were also blind, there would be no story. The only way this makes sense is if you see the whole elephant, right? Listen, you poor blind people groping in the dark, I see what you don't see. There's an elephant here, and I see that you're touching one part or you're touching another part, but I see. But if we're all supposed to be blind, then how would you even know there's an elephant, is his point. So actually, it's very subtle, but the parable sort of sneaks in an arrogance that we don't see, but it makes its way into our, our culture and our thinking. How could you know that each blind man only sees part of the elephant unless you claim to be able to see the whole elephant? How could you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth unless you yourself have superior comprehensive knowledge of spiritual reality that you just said no religion's supposed to have? Some of you are going, huh? I never liked philosophy class. <laughs> Others of you are nodding, you're tracking along with me. Hopefully you're tracking with the main point here. Here's the point. All religions are not the same. At best, they're at the same at a superficial level, but they're profoundly different on the level that matters. And they cannot all be equally true because truth by definition has edges and boundaries to it. Now myth number three. Christianity is narrow-minded and arrogant. Okay, fair enough, all religions are the same, and maybe there's one that's true, but, but why do you get to claim that you have the truth, you Christians? How could you know? It's narrow-minded and arrogant to think that you have a, a corner on the truth market for thinking and claiming that Jesus is the only way to God. Now, if you accept the two previous myths, that all religions are the same, basically, and that they are all equally valid or true, then, then you're right. It would be narrow-minded and arrogant. But if you begin to see that maybe that's not correct, it's not at all narrow-minded to act on the evidence and to pursue truth. Let me give you an example from our family. I mentioned Noah a moment ago. I have two sons, Benjamin, who turned 19 yesterday. He's our baby. Both our boys, when they were born, had jaundice. They are both born pretty early. They, they looked like they were put in a skin sack that was too big for them. You know, they were all wrinkly and yellow. They did, they, everybody thinks their baby's cute. Ours weren't that cute. And they, they're cute later, but initially it's like, Ugh. you know, they, they, what happened there? They were yellow and wrinkly, you know. I love them, but they just look weird. Anyway, <laughs> and when the doctor came and said to us, your, your son has jaundice, uh, you know, some babies have jaundice, but it, it pretty much is, you don't have to treat it much. Maybe it, it goes away pretty quickly. But a significant level of jaundice is serious. It means there's a problem with the liver. And our doctor said that it's because the bilirubin, but he had an accident. He called, he called it bilirubin. I'm like, Billy who? Billy who? Who, who gave my kid jaundice? Who's bilirubin? I'll, I'll get him. I don't know what that meant, you know. He said the bilirubin count is too high, and you're, the only way to treat this is to put him under like a, you, some of you will know this, the blue lights. You'll see an image here. 
what it looks like. So that little Noah there, under the blue lights, you know, burning out the Billy Rubens, you know, and getting rid of his jaundice and just stay in this little incubator like that. And then when we brought him home, he had like a little glow worm blanket to keep the lights on him, you know. Now, what if we would have said as parents, listen, fair enough, you went to medical school and you think you know things, doctor, but that seems very narrow-minded and arrogant of us to say there's only one way to treat this. We're going to just give him a really good bath and scrub the yellow off him. We're going to dip him in bleach. We're going to try some other things to get rid of the jaundice. We just don't think this is the only way to do this. We don't want to be inconvenienced by this. And why, how, how could you impose this, this way of doing it onto us? Nobody would, we, you'd think we were crazy if we said that. Why? The doctor would be saying, listen, I studied this. I've treated hundreds of babies, thousands even. I know this, that this worked. There's one way to fix your son's issues with his liver and his jaundice, and it's this way. And all of your thinking differently isn't going to change that. And if you, don't do, if you don't follow this path, you jeopardize this life. The point of the Christian gospel is we're, we have a sickness unto death. There's a soul sickness. There's a real condition in every human being called sin. It's not popular to talk about. People don't like to use that word, but it's true. We're rebels in alienated from God by our own destructive behaviors, thoughts, decisions. And there's one cure. There's one way to treat it. And it's not arrogant or narrow-minded. It's compassionate and loving, if that's true, for the God to say, I am giving you my son as the cure. You can reject it and think that's narrow and, and arrogant, but he, I believe Jesus when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe he said it not as an elitist claim to exclude people, but to invite all people in. He said it out of love and compassion. It, it, Timothy Keller in his book, The Reason for God, said, Christianity is the most inclusive exclusivity. What? It's the most inclusive. Ex when Jesus says, narrow is the road that leads to life and broad is the path that leads to, to destruction. It's the most inclusive, meaning it, the thief on the cross, from the worst, the least educated, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, it doesn't matter your socioeconomic background, none of that matters. All are invited, all are welcome, but all must come and surrender to Jesus. All are invited, but you're not all invited on your terms, you're all invited on his terms. It's the most inclusive exclusivity. It's as wide as the universe and as narrow as the cross. Let's look now at the one great truth claim. The one great truth claim. Luke Ferry, I referenced him last week. He's a French atheist ex existentialist. Uh, he wrote a book called the, A Brief History of Thought. It's very accessible for a French atheist existentialist. It's tracing out the development of philosophical and religious thought in, in the Western world. And he's an, he doesn't believe, but here's what he writes. He says, compared to the doctrine of Christianity, whose promise of the resurrection of the body means that we shall be reunited with those that we love after death and have a life eternal with God. A humanism without metaphysics is pretty weak beer. I grant you amongst the available doctrines of salvation that nothing can compare with Christianity, except for the fact that I don't believe it. But were it to be true, I would certainly be a taker. Isn't that a great line? I mean, great to a point. He's saying... I get, he, he gets the claim. It's so unique and so compelling that he would take it if it were true. He doesn't believe it. He hasn't come to personal faith. But he understands there's something unique and different here. Let's briefly examine this one claim of Jesus in the time we have left. Verse 6. John 14, verse 6. So T Jesus says, I'm going to go away, meaning after his death and his resurrection. And Thomas says, where are you going? The, the disciples ask dumb questions. There are no dumb questions, only dumb people who ask them, my coach once told me. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It's a simple little sentence, but it's so packed with profound wisdom. Let's walk through these statements. First, I am. You could do a, a, a fascinating study. We don't have time this morning, but if you walk through the New Testament, look for all the I am statements of Jesus. Some of you will know that the, the, the sacred name of God given the Old Testament is the name Yahweh. 
in Hebrew. In fact, if you go and look in your Old Testament Bible, anytime you see the word Lord, that's in all capital letters, L-O-R-D, all caps, not L capital and small O-R-D, but all caps, that's a reference to the sacred name of God, Yahweh. And it's the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. Remember this story? And Moses has a bunch of excuses. He doesn't want to go back to Pharaoh in Egypt. He says, uh, what if I don't know what to say? And God says, I made your mouth. I'll, I'll handle that. And he goes, well, what if the people ask me who sent me? What should I say? He's essentially saying in a roundabout way, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. The truncated version of that is Yahweh. I am. The eternally present self-existent one. If they ask, tell them I am has sent you. Jesus has a number of places in the New Testament where he says, I am. In John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. We'll go through some of these next week. But here he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's easy to miss in English, but he's making a singular claim to divinity, a bold claim, an exclusive claim, an extreme claim. Then he says, the way. Now, he's not saying you can't know anything about God or you cannot know any truth if you're not a Christian. He's saying you cannot know God personally as a father without him. You can know about God, you can study the world's religions, you can memorize chapter and verse of the Bible, and many do. But you will not know God, not as a boss in heaven, or as a great judge in the sky, or the Santa Clausification of God, right? He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. You better watch out, he's gonna get you. Some of us grew up with a God like that the big God in the sky who's going to bless or curse based on how we live. That's not who God is, the Bible says. God is a loving Father, and you can't know him that way except through Jesus. You can know about him. You can have information. But you, it, it's, a, it's a promise of personal intimacy because the whole section around this verse is, he says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Philip, Philip says, right, show us the Father. Jesus says, you're an idiot. He doesn't say that, but he says, like, he's like, I'm with you this whole time, and you're still asking for the Father? He's in me. You're, you're looking at him. Jesus is saying, the way into a life with God, to know the Father loves you, to be secure in his love, not to be fearful of him or think he's out to get you or wonder if he cares, but to know that he loves you, the way we loved our little boy under the Billy Rubin lights, right? The way you love your kids, if you have kids. The way your parents love you. Or are supposed to. Those are just tiny reflections of God's love. And Jesus says, I'm the way to know the Father loves you like that, infinitely. That's what he's saying when he says, I'm the way. He's not saying, I'll teach you the path of enlightenment. He says, I am the way into a relationship with the Father based on love and grace. Then he says, I'm the truth. I am the truth. We have elections coming up again. Yippee. <laughs> Some politician got up there and said, I am the truth, right? It just, it's craziness. Jesus is not saying, I will teach you the truth. I will show you how to walk in the truth. He's saying, I am the truth. All questions about eternity and existence and truth end with me, he's saying. They all lead to me. All honest seeking of the truth eventually ends up here at the cross with me, he's saying. I am the truth. John Lennox says every, every chain of questioning eventually stops the person of Christ if the questioner is honest. Truth is a person. Truth is not a set of principles that you follow or adhere to intellectually. Truth is a person who's personally revealed and invites you into a personal relationship. So this means that truth is not a set of ideas that we master, but as a person that masters us. It's so d- different than what we're trained to think, isn't it? Entering into a relationship with God doesn't mean I gotta get everything figured out and then I'm, I'm the man, you know. It's surrender to him who is the truth. And then he says, I am the life. This goes back to week one. Does life have a purpose? We're all longing for and looking for something to live for. 
Jesus is not merely saying, let me show you the five principles, the eightfold path, the six things, the whatever, the 12 rules. He's, he's not saying, let me show you how to live and give you a life based on these teachings. He, he is a teacher, but he's saying, I am the life. He is life. John chapter 1, verse 14, we read these words. In him was life, and that life is the light of all mankind. In him. All other teachers are telling you how to live a life. They're giving you good advice. The gospel of Jesus Christ fundamentally is not advice. Advice is better to our modern ears, right? Because you could take it or leave it. That sounds good. That sounds dumb. I'm, I might try that. I might not try that. There's a lot of stupid advice if you go on social media, right? I, I just wait till the next time we find out that kale is causing cancer, right? <laughs> like everything you think is good now is going to be bad. In the, just wait. Just wait. Right? There's all kinds of advice, and it's conflicting. Jesus is not saying, I'm giving you advice. He's saying, it's me. It's me. Surrender your life to me. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And the invitation to you, this life, is as broad as there are a number of people in the world. And it's as narrow as the cross, the person of Jesus Christ. You know, interestingly, in some of the reading that I did years ago about um, different world religions, uh, Ravi Zacharias wrote a book called Jesus Among Other Gods, and in that book he quotes that, the, you know, some of you know the parable of the prodigal son. How many of you know the parable of the prodigal son? Great story. Luke 15, if you haven't read it, it's a great story. The way, two sons, the younger one demands his inheritance, runs off, blows all the money, and to, and to ask for your inheritance early in that ancient culture, dad didn't have an ATM. He can't just go and cash out a 401k or one of his IRAs and give his son his money. He had to liquidate his assets, which was, which was flocks, crops, herds, and it, was, it would reduce the net worth of the whole family. So that means the older son's getting a, a, it affects everybody. Gives the son his inheritance, which would have been about one quarter to one third because he's younger, goes off and blows it all in just really destructive decisions. And then comes back to try to be a slave or a servant in his father's house. Thinking, I'm not worthy to be called a son, but maybe since I'm starving and I have no life left, he'll let me back in as a servant. And what does the father do? This This is the part that rips your heart out. The father sees his son and runs down the road to him. Runs to him, embraces him, kisses him, puts the robe on, the symbol of the family's covering, puts the ring on, the symbol of the family's significance, and says, you're back in, you're not a servant, you're my son. That's the gospel. We shake our fist at God and do our own thing. Eventually come to a place and realize it's not working. Humbly come to God and say, well, maybe, well, maybe. And God says, welcome in, my daughter, my son. Now, the Buddhist version in the, the uh, Sutra Upana, the Sutra, uh, I forget what it's called now, the Lotus Sutra. I, I didn't actually read it, I just read it and quoted this book. The, uh, this parable works like this. Same exact context. Two sons, the younger one blows all the money, runs away, and when he comes back, the father disguises himself as a landlord servant and forces his son to work for 25 years, hard labor, seeing if his son is worthy, seeing if he earns it. And eventually the father reveals himself after 25 years, the the young man proves himself worthy to be back in the family. How different? How different are those stories? One is, you don't deserve it and the father will be right to cast you out, but he loves you and he invites you in. The other is, you gotta earn it. You gotta earn it. Friends, I believe Jesus was telling the truth when he said to us, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And if you want to know God as a loving father, there is one way. It's me. I don't believe that's narrow. I don't believe that's arrogant. I believe that's loving and compassionate. I believe that's hard to hear in our culture because we're believing a whole bunch of myths that are leading us into confusion. You might be here and you might disagree with that. That's okay. It's okay to disagree. But I want you to hear that Jesus says to you this morning, I'm the way. I'm the truth you've been seeking. I'm the life you long to have. Surrender to me and know the depth of God's love for you. Let's pray. Father God, I know that my words are inadequate to communicate the power of this single verse. But I pray that your Holy Spirit would do that work. 
I know that many of us come from different contexts and backgrounds, and some of us are, just need to be reaffirmed of what we believe, but I know there are people here who are still wrestling with this. Again, God, I ask that you'd speak to them, that they would see and believe it's not an accident they're here this morning. I believe, God, that you want to teach us something about what truth really is. It's not something we create for ourselves. It's not something that we discover. It's you revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you do not stand far off while we blindly grope for meaning, but you come to us. You make yourself known to us. You live the life we're supposed to live, but could not. You die the death we deserve, and you conquer sin in the grave and invite us all into your family if we will but surrender ourselves to you. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, you who are the way, the truth, and the life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.